Hi guys, thank you so much for tuning into the Power Within podcast. I'm your host, Lori. Today, I'm thrilled to share with you this episode with Amber Marshall. Amber is such a genuine and authentic human being, and I love the opportunity to chat with her about Heartland and filming. We get to talk about her Marshall's country store that she owns. We talked about nature and animals, and I just really enjoyed getting to speak with her and share this conversation with you guys. I hope that you all love this as much as I did. And I also wanted to let everyone know um, that in the link tree for wherever you're watching this, if you go in the link tree, there is an opportunity for any of the listeners on here to be, um, if they would like to um, be entered for it, um, there is a giveaway for this episode for a gift card to Amber's uh, store, Marshall's Country Store. So that's over on Instagram. I did link it right out. So um, if you click the link there and you want to go enter, you guys can go ahead and do that. And I will have the winner for that picked out on March 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I hope you all enjoy this episode. I hope that you get a lot out of it, please let me know your thoughts. Uh, I hope you guys all enjoy this. So without further ado. Hello, and welcome to the Power Within podcast. I'm your host, Lori. And today I'm delighted to have Amber Marshall on the show. Amber, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Lori. So I want to start off with I'm going to start off with Heartland. So you have been on Heartland for it just finished its 17th season. And I know many people are hoping for 18. I just want to know what keeps you excited about the show after this many years. Oh my goodness. It's been kind of unbelievable when I look back at it and when I think about what we've accomplished in the last 17 years to on and off the show. And if we go into our 18th season, I was 18 when I started filming Heartland. So I will have been on the show as long as I haven't been off, been on the show, which is crazy to think about. Um, 18 years, that's that's a really long time um, for any job. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And in the world of film and television, that's, that's almost unheard of. So I think the main thing that keeps me going is that I still love it. You know, there is not a day where I'm like, oh, this job sucks. I have to go to work again. It's I, I still genuinely love the show. I love the people I work with. I love where I'm working. And I think that that was kind of a major player way back in season two when I decided to fully relocate myself to Alberta, where the show takes place, because I felt like I was being uprooted each year. You know, season one, I'm from Ontario. So season one, I flew out and um, production found me a condo to stay in. And so I packed up all my stuff and I came out here and loved it, loved the people, loved Alberta. And then at the end of the season, I packed my bags again and went back home. Um, and I was living in my parents' house at the time. So I just felt very displaced. And season two, I was like, you know, I don't know how long this show is going to go. I don't know if it's going to go another year, two years, five years, 18 years. Who knows? I, I had no clue. I was in the dark. But I was young and I was looking for something that really was calling to me. And that was Alberta. Alberta just took me in and I made that change. And I think that that also has really been what's kept me going because I get to work and live in my favorite place. So I think that that's something that not everybody, especially actors, are fortunate to be able to do. Most of the time, your work takes you away from your home. So in this case, my work is in my own backyard, which really is everybody's dream job. Yeah, Alberta is absolutely beautiful. I spent a lot of time there this summer and it was gorgeous. Now for you for um, since you have been on the show for so long, what do you think for yourself has been your biggest personal growth in over those years? And what have you learned the most from from playing Amy Fleming? Yeah, I think that in my opinion, your 20s are your biggest period of growth in anyone's life. It's kind of when you're learning who you are, who you wanna be, who you wanna hang out with, where you wanna live, like all of these things that are happening so fast. And you're still, you're not quite an adult, even though technically you are, you're still trying to learn who you are. And I think that being a part of this show really shaped who I was, because not only was I around very inspiring and kind people, but I was in an atmosphere that I felt very comfortable in. And I was in a place that just felt like home. So I think that in my 20s, being 
living them out on the Heartland set, making such great friendships and relationships and just be and even being with the horses every day. I really do believe that that shaped who I am today. And I look back to think if I wasn't on Heartland and, you know, what would I be doing in my 20s? And at the time when I got the the call for Heartland, I was set to go to university in Toronto. And I think back now, I'm like, how different my life would be if I had spent, you know, the beginning of my 20s downtown Toronto in a university atmosphere. I feel like I would be a very different person today. So I owe a lot to Heartland for for shaping me and and just giving me a direction without me even knowing it. Because I think when we're young, we're searching for, you know, what what are we meant to do? What do we want to do? What's the next 30, 40, 50 years of my work life look like? And all of a sudden it was a decision I didn't really have to make. So I think that that's something for me that not only I've learned over my time on Heartland, but it's just been a part of me. It's been something that was so organic and it just happened. And it wasn't like I really had to make a choice one way or another. It was just, it was just presented. And yeah, it's, it's, been some hard work too. It's not, not every day is rainbows and unicorns and you have to be able to be outside in some really harsh elements every day. And you have to be able to work long hours and you have to be able to give up your um, friendships for the majority of the time that you're filming because we don't have time for anything outside of work. But if you can do all of that, then in the end, it's extra rewarding. That's amazing. And you've also, so this year you also did another film, My Christmas Guide. And I know that that was a really loved film. It was one of the top 10 Christmas movies this year and it was excellent. So I'd like to know when you're looking for roles outside of Heartland, what do you look at that makes you, when you're reading the script, go, okay, I want to audition for this or this piques my interest and I want to do that. Is there specific character traits that you want to do or do you look for different things in different roles? Yes and no. I think as far as the character traits go, I always like to play roles that are still going to resonate with my fan base. I don't want to do anything that's too dark and too offside that people might be looking at me differently when they see and watch Heartland. I want to keep it in my my realm. Um, but at the same time, I want to do projects that are different from Heartland as well. And so I think that 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 film caught me because I was like, you know what? It's a great story. It's it's very traditional love Christmas. You get all the good vibes, similar as to watching Heartland. You get all that the good feelings inside. Um, but it also took me to a different filming location. We were filming that on the east coast of Canada in Newfoundland, and that's actually kind of what caught my interest in the beginning because I said I've filmed in Alberta for so many years now. I've almost lost touch of the acting world and the film and television world outside of Alberta. And so it was just something that piqued my interest. And I went, you know, I want to go, I want to go see what it's, what it's like, you know, what it's like outside of our world that we've created. Because again, Alberta is, we've had some amazing productions come out of this province, but it's a lot of the same crews that I've worked with. And so I know almost everyone in Alberta, which is great. And it makes it feel very homey and inviting. Um, but picking myself up, taking myself out of a comfort zone and going to the other side of the country and working with people that I've never met before, never worked with before. That was inspiring to me because I feel like you have to do that every once in a while, not just to realize what it is you want or that you're just loving where you are and what you're doing, but just to kind of have that refresh. And I think that coming back to set on Heartland, last spring, right after I had done, you know, six weeks in Newfoundland with a whole different crew, gave me a new appreciation of different things. And it's not that it was not a great experience in Newfoundland. It was just very different than Heartland because Heartland has been going for so many years that the cast and crew, we feel like a family. And so even though you, you have a great rapport with the people you work with on other projects, you're never going to have that 18 years of connection and stories and reminiscing and all of those things. So coming back to Heartland really felt like kind of the the family reunion type thing where you're like, oh, yeah, I remember when that happened. And OK, and it's just the groove is already set. So as soon as you step place on set, 
you're ready, you know the expectations, you know what everybody's supposed to do and you know who to ask the right questions to and who you don't want to talk to, <laughs> you know, all of the little things that you've learned throughout the years that just make that so smooth. And that's another reason why I think I, I enjoy this show so much is I've learned all those things. I've made the mistakes. And yes, you're still continually learning every day, no matter how long you've done something. But at least you go into it knowing knowing who to ask and, and who to kind of talk over your, your thoughts with. And that's what's really special about Heartland for me. And how big of an adjustment is is it for you? Because I know like the, the Christmas movies and stuff, they tend to shoot, it's like a very condensed schedule. And then it's, you have Heartland that's, I know that there's, it's very fast paced too, but how much of an adjustment is that going from doing like a movie like that after you've been doing Heartland for so long? Oh, I'm actually really glad you brought it up because it's something that I've kind of pushed out of my mind because it was very daunting going on the Christmas movie with a script and we were doing double the page count that I'm used to filming on Heartland in a day. So now, and I was very thankful that I was staying in a hotel. I wasn't at home. I didn't have chores to do. I didn't have all this stuff to think about when I got home because I had to actually spend, you know, a good hour every night when I got home going over the material, which I don't have to do on Heartland. Heartland for me, I know my character so well. I know the writing so well that it just, it's just in my brain. All I have to do is open it up and look at what I have to do for the next day and I've got it. And that's what people say a lot of times. They're like, how do you memorize your lines and how do you, how long do you spend doing this? And the answer is it really depends on the role and the job and what that day brings. Because like I said, Heartland, we, we don't take on as much dialogue each day. And a lot of it, especially for me, is horse related and action. So that kind of stuff takes a lot longer to film, but you're not memorizing a whole bunch of different, um, you know, dialogues and things like that. It's mostly re me remembering, okay, I'm going to work with the horse in the round pen and I really have to connect with it at this point. And, but it's not, it's not a lot of dialogue. Whereas that movie, I was struggling. I was like, wow, I have, a lot of, and, and we didn't have a lot of time to do multiple takes. So you had to be on it, right? It's like, okay, where we've got two takes to do this and then we've got to move on. And there's like a big, long monologue. I'm like, okay, I think I'm ready. But then you start working yourself up because you don't want to let people down because you also, you've just met these people and you're in a space where you're not as comfortable. And so there's a little bit of nerves and it's, it's a whole nother thing, which I'm really, glad that I was able to experience because like I said, you, you do the same thing with the same people year after year and you kind of take that stuff for granted. You don't really think deeper into it. Like, oh, this might actually take a lot more work to get to the same place that I feel comfortable working with my character on Heartland. That's, that's incredible. And I, so when you're out in these different environments too, like when you have to um, go film somewhere that it's not Alberta. And then if you're, even when you're traveling, I know that you've talked about how nature is really your calming centering space. What do you do when you're not in those areas and you can't do that? How do you find yourself like recentering and getting aligned in, in a way that doesn't involve nature when that can't be a part of it? That's a really good question. These are great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I struggled. It was hard. It was really hard living in a hotel. Um, I almost wished I had have brought my dog Rain because even though it would have been logistical nightmare trying to figure out with the schedule I had, but I was like, I almost need, because I would go out for walks every day, but I was right downtown um, and I didn't have a vehicle. And it was a snowstorm of all snowstorms. Like it was the whole time I was there, it was windy, snow blowing sideways, freezing cold, like all of the things that for me, I don't enjoy being out in. So it was definitely a challenge. And I did things like, like I, I can't remember the last time I took a bath. I'm not a bather. I find it a waste of time and I usually have other things to do. So I'm like quick shower and get on with it. I took three baths while I was there. <laughs> like I was like, Oh, there's a bathtub. People do this. They like sit in the bathtub for an hour. Um, so maybe, maybe it was things like that, that I did that kind of helped center me or ground me because again I was kind of stuck in a hotel room 
which for me, I'm not that person. And with it being so cold outside and just not somewhere that I wanted to just be wandering around all the time, I did find it quite a, quite a struggle. Now, the saving grace there was that we worked a lot. I really didn't have any downtime. So we were working, you know, 14, 15 hour days, and then I would come home and I would have to put in a good hour learning all my lines and what we're doing the next day. And so by the time I crawled into bed, I wasn't even thinking about, oh, I should go for a walk or I should, you know, go do something. Um, it was just different. It was different than my routine here. You know, I work at Heartland and I might work a 14 hour day on Heartland, but then I come home and it's usually nice out because most of the time we film in the summer. So I come home and I wander around with the animals and I do chores and that's just kind of my, um, relaxation or my way to wind down. And I'm not, people will find this funny because I'm on television, but I'm not a television watcher. I actually didn't turn the TV on that entire month that I was in Newfoundland. I didn't watch a single thing. And so for me, that's not my wind down. So what I found myself doing is when I would come home um, before I could get into like learning my lines and doing that, I needed a bit of a wind down. So I would just go and sit in the restaurant in the hotel and I would order a couple hors d'oeuvres and I would just sit there and I, you know, sometimes I'd even just sit there and talk on the phone with my husband, but I just needed something to do. And that was eating good food and, you know, just like kind of taking my mind away from the work aspect and getting out of the hotel room. Cause I found if I just stayed in the hotel room, I would go crazy. So it was a way for my mind to keep active and I would people watch and I would just sit there and kind of take it all in. And that's, almost comparable to when I come home and I sit on a fence post and I watch my animals congregate around and uh, interact. I could sit there at the hotel restaurant and watch the people come in and see the interactions. And it's a very similar thing for me. That's kind of where I get my stories, I guess you would say, is by watching the interactions around me. Um, so that would be probably one of the ways that I, I, chose to to wind down or to find my center when I was there. And you talked about how like usually you'll watch animals for the interaction and I, um, I know you had talked about this before. Um, so I have a question on that. So I know that you can kind of gauge like the, the um, similarities. What do you find when you observe animals um, outside of like the like the physical and obvious uh, differences. What do you find is the biggest differences between animals and humans? Um, animals are a lot more subtle and they're also more direct, if that makes sense. So if an animal isn't happy with the way another animal is treating them or acting or eating that food when they shouldn't be eating that food or whatever it is, they just deal with it right then and there. There's no like tiptoeing around like, oh, should I tell that person or should I tell that animal that I don't like what they're doing? Whereas humans internalize that a lot more and we think about it, we ponder it. And by the time we actually approach the situation, sometimes it's too late. And sometimes that reaction time between when the thing, whatever it could be happened. And when we address it, there's too much time that's gone by. And even if it's, you know, only an hour, that makes a huge difference. Whereas animals, they address everything in the present. So just an example, say, um, say my husband walked in and, and put a can down on the counter. And I'm like, I wish he would put that in the recycling. I would you know, and I'll sit here and I'll look at that can and I'll be like, Hmm, should I get up and put it in the recycling and just not make it a big deal? Should I tell him to do it so he knows not to do it next time? I think about it. And I think as humans, we just do this. We think and we think and we think. And then finally, we figure out whatever solution we think is the best way and we handle it. But so much time has happened that it almost loses the, the gravity of the situation or it just makes it even bigger than it should be because we've pondered it for so long. So for example, if that was an animal, Instantly, that can goes down, their head would turn and they would shake whatever animal, like let's say it's a horse. A horse would pin its ears, toss its head, and that other horse would be like, oh, sorry. You know, it all happens simultaneously. There's no, there's no pondering. There's no letting it sit there and um, simmer, I guess you would say. So I think that's the biggest difference 
from my observations of watching animals and humans. And I try to learn from animals in this way too. I mean, humans are just, we're overthinkers. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter how you put it. That's just what humans do. And then as we overthink, things either get diluted or they get into something that's even bigger than they should be. So if I could give some advice to everyone out there, it's to be more reactionary, but not in a way that's aggressive. You know, some people are the opposite and they'll see that and they'll be like, don't do that. You're like, whoa, it's just a can. So it's, it's more about having that center where you can say, I don't like that there. You know, like, let's, let's find a different solution as opposed to sitting, thinking about it or snapping when it happens. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but that's something that I always observe with animals. Yeah, it does. So I know that you've been working with animals since you were very young. What do you think is the biggest or most important lesson that you've learned from an animal in your life? Like one specific animal that taught me a lesson or just in general? Just like in general, whether it's through observation or interaction or whatever it happened to be, is there like any significant moment where you learn something about yourself that was really, that impacted you in a big way? I'm always learning about myself from animals and I'm learning about the relationships around me from animals as well. And just seeing how, how they navigate through life. Cause like I just said, animals are very, um, in the moment, they're very present. And I think that humans could learn a lot from that just by being present and being there. They're not thinking about what's happening next month, their schedules, anything like that. They're thinking about exactly what their wants and needs are in that moment. And yes, it's important to plan. It's important to have schedules, all of these. I'm not saying don't do that, but I think overall, the thing that I've learned is to be happy with yourself and those around you in that moment and not be thinking about, oh, you know, I've got to do this or that person did this to me yesterday or like all of those things. Animals don't do that. They don't hold those grudges. They don't think about what's happening 10 days from now. They're just looking in that moment and how you are reacting to them and how they're reacting to you in that moment is crucial because that's how they survive. And I think humans were probably like that hundreds of thousands of years ago, but we've lost that over time because everything now is about convenience and scheduling and all of these things. We're not thinking, okay, I'm, I'm watching what's going on around me because I might get eaten by a bear in 30 seconds, or I need to find food for tonight or whatever it might be. We've lost a lot of that just because of our own circumstances, because everything is so accessible and, um, and the communication has changed a lot. And I'm sure you've noticed this. I'm sure your viewers have noticed this, but the youth right now is so absorbed with technology that a lot of them have lost how to communicate in the present. So if you're, and I, I do notice this at events and different things, and I, I don't like to use that as an example, because a lot of times if fans come out to an event, they're already shy. It's not really a good represent representation of how they would be in another public setting. But if I'm just out um, and I, I see people interacting, even if you're just, if I don't know them, that could just be at the movie theater and I see a bunch of teenagers sitting at a table, well, nine out of 10 of them are on their phone and they're not engaging with each other. And so if you're not engaging in the present with those around you, whether they be humans or animals, you're not growing, you're not developing all of those skills that you need to carry you through life. And yes, there's things that you can learn through your phone. You know, I look up things on Google all the time. I'm like, oh, I need to know this. But you're not learning essential human interaction, which I believe in the animal world and the human world comes number one. Because if you don't know how to read the people around you or communicate with the people around you in the present physical form, then how are you gonna grow? How are you gonna know where you need to be next? And how are you gonna learn from those people if you can't even communicate with them? So I think that overall is what animals have taught me. There's a lot of specific scenarios that I've learned 
things from that uh, just one that I'll share right now is when I was a young teen, I think I was maybe 13. Um, I went for, I would go for a ride every night on my horse and, you know, my mom would drop me off after school. I would go for a ride and I took this path that I don't normally take and you shouldn't do that when you're by yourself, but I went and got off track and I ended up getting lost and the sun was setting. And at that time, like I didn't have a phone. I was, I didn't have a phone until I was almost out of high school. So, uh, here I am, no phone, no watch. I just see that it's getting dark. I'm starting to get scared. I'm by myself. And I just remember my mom always said, she's like, trust your animals. Like they always know, they always know, just trust them, listen to them. And so I was just like, okay, horse always wants to go home. They always want to go back to the barn. So I just dropped my reins. I kicked my horse and she picked her way through the trails all the way back home. And I remember coming over the hill and seeing the barn and just being like, yes, trust when you don't know which way to go trust those who believe in you trust those around you who are your support group and that's always stuck with me as well because you just ha sometimes you have to lean on those around you you know if you're not feeling like you know the way if you're not feeling yourself if whatever the situation might be i was physically lost like it wasn't a it wasn't something metaphorical i was physically lost and i trusted my horse, my companion, the one I was with to lead me to the right way. And I think that that's really important in life. It doesn't matter if you're physically lost or um, mentally, you just don't know what to do. Trust your support group and, and find those people or those animals or whatever it might be that you resonate with, that you connect with, that you do trust so that you can ask these questions. And sometimes it's as simple as that, just dropping the reins and trusting who you're with. And I use that example because I do feel it's very fitting to myself, my character, um, who I am, but it's, it kind of leads to that bigger picture of let's just put faith in those around us to help build us up when we're down and you don't have to take on everything by yourself. And so that's what worries me leading back into the world of technology is when you're relying on a device to be your support you don't have that human connection. You don't have that physicality of those people around you. And I think that that's something that's greatly missing in today's society and that we need to just put down our technology and start building back those relationships, those connections and being able to, to be comfortable with that. I love that you actually just brought this up because um, I was looking at something the other day and there's like restaurants that are starting to have like lock boxes on the table. And so mm -hmm. if you go in and you will put your phones there and lock them up in the box, they'll give you like 20% off your bill or something because Which they want awesome. you to yeah, they want you to interact with your family and, and your friends when you're out. And um, even myself, like I've completely changed the way that I look at social media. And I do like that you do share your farm, you share your business, and then you have like your rambling rides where you share like the charities that mean a lot to you. And, um, but you don't overshare. And so, especially with someone in your position, how hard is that sometimes to navigate? Because people do want so much access to everybody now, instead of just living their own life or wanting to know what everyone's up to all the time. Yeah, I think, and I've gone through different stages. You know, when I first came on social media, I was like, I have to post every day. And it, it almost became this chore that I would get stressed out about. Cause I'm like, I don't have anything to post today. What am I going to post? And in the last probably two years, I have just said, you know what, this is not, this is not me. If I don't want to post, I'm not going to, I want to do this because I enjoy it. And yes, I could bring someone in and have someone that posts every day and keeps up with that kind of thing too. But I said, no, because that's not authentic to me and who I am. And yes, I have a team that helps me with my store posts and that kind of thing, because it's slightly different. It's a business. So you're wanting to promote your business. And I think that's what a lot of people on social me media don't realize is that they watch me on TV. They know my character, they know the show. But then once I'm on my personal Instagram, that's me, that's my life. And it's not, it's not my job to post every day. 
it's not my obligation to put as much content out as I can. It's my own personal choice. And I mean, my fans are amazing. And I, I have to say that again and again, because it's all, I'll sometimes I'll apologize. Sorry, I haven't posted in a while. And everyone's like, Amber, it's your life. Like post when you want, we're happy to hear from you. Um, but there's always going to be people out there that want more and want more. And I think from what I have experienced in my life, when people are always wanting more from someone else is because they're not diving deep inside and really fulfilling their own lives. So that's, again, if, if I can put something out there, it's like, if you're really pressuring those around you for something, maybe look inside and say, okay, so what can I do to fulfill whatever I'm trying to, to find here? And I feel like I, I've done that more for myself in the last two years. I've said, you know what, this is not, my life is not about fulfilling social media. It's not about how much content I put out. It's not about the quality. And I do like to, like, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, of a perfectionist in some ways, you know, I want to make sure that if I'm doing a video or I'm putting something up that it looks nice, it's presentable, those types of things. But at the same time, it's like, I'm not going to bring in a full team to capture those images and that video content just so that I can put it up on social media. And for me, it's not about, it's not about the followers. And I just, I just passed 1 million Instagram followers not long ago. And that was kind of cool. Like, I, I can't say that I wasn't like, Oh, a million. Oh. I was like, wow, I, I've reached a million followers. Like I was, I was happy about that, but I didn't push for it. I never, you know, I was never that person who was like, um, tag three people, follow me and I'll follow you back and like push, 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 because I don't feel that that aligns with who I am. That's not who I am on the farm. That's not who I am with my animals, my husband, my friends. Like I'm not a pushy person. And the way that I interact is that I kind of see where everybody's at. And that's, I'm kind of referring to my animals because that's my main social activity is I walk out in the field and if somebody, if an animal is receptive to me, then I'm going to give them lots of loving and I'm going to pet them all over. If they're moving away from me, I'm not going to push that. I'm not going to be like, get back here. Like you need your cuddles. And each one of them has a very specific um, aura to them. And you watch how they interact with each other. So you can't be surprised when they interact the same way with you that they do with the rest of the herd. I have horses that are the boss. I have horses that are the bottom of the pecking order. And if you sit and pay attention and watch closely, you'll know exactly what's going to happen when you walk out there just by watching them interact. And I think that that's a really good lesson for humans, because when you walk into a room with, let's say there's 50 people, you don't know any of them. You can read that room pretty quickly because humans are a lot more, um, dramatic about their uh, responses than animals are. And so if you understand just the regular fundamentals of a herd dynamic, when you walk into a crowded place with humans, it's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. You're going to have your alpha of the group. You're going to have your people that just want to kind of keep to themselves. Um, and it's all very apparent through body language. And I think that that's something that I've really started to become more in tune with is that when I'm in a social environment, I'm like, okay. And I'm not being an actor. You would think that I'm very like extroverted and, you know, I want to be out and social and I'm not that person at all. I'm quite introverted actually. And so I can put it on. I'm an actor. I can go out and I can, you know, pretend that I love big groups of people, but I'm not really that person at all. Um, so that for me, it's really important to be able to go into a crowded room and understand the fundamentals of the relationships and the, the workings of communication before I even pr like put myself in that situation. So I think animals have taught me that and just allowed me to, to be more confident in those situations too, because you know, I already kind of know what I'm getting myself into before I really put myself in the middle of a situation. I love um, you had shared on one of your rambling rides when you had taken in a baby horse. Um, 
about tough love and I wanted to share with you because I actually recently had to take my nieces because my sister was having another baby so I took them for a week and my niece was one my the oldest niece was really like acting up and and I was like okay I'm gonna go back to Amber's video like don't acknowledge that you know and it really yes. worked though it it's really yeah. it's incredibly helpful so thank you for that <laughs> I'm really glad I can give parenting advice now. <laughs> when you look at it, animal relationships and human relationships are the same. You know, it's the same principles. And I've always been a big believer in reward the good, ignore the bad. And there's time because a lot of animals are just trying to get your attention. So they're doing things, they're acting out. And this is just like kids. They're acting out so that you pay attention to them because they know if like, my one horse hawk, notorious for pawing the fence. And we have metal fences and he'll stand there and go ding, 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 ding. And he will paw that fence forever. And if you give him that attention and you say, stop that, don't do that. Whatever you're going to say, he's like, ha ha, they're paying attention. Whereas if I just completely ignore it, he's like, oh, this isn't working. And he walks away. So it's the same type of idea, I believe, with kids where it's like, they want to know that you love them, that you're paying attention to them, that there's there's something that they have that you are interested in. And so if you're not rewarding the good, they're going to start acting out because they know that if they're bad enough, you're going to pay attention to them. And sometimes, just like animals, they're just pushing the limits just because they want to see how far they can get too, right? It's just that like the young horse that you're referring to ranger he would just test 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 and it wasn't just with me he would test with every herd member on the farm the cows the horses the dogs he was constantly poking at everyone and that's that was actually a really unique situation for me because every other horse i've ever had respects the lead horse they they know that once that horse says nope enough's enough they're like oh Okay, sorry. And he would push our lead horse is Hippie. He would push Hippie's buttons daily. And Hippie would give him all the same cues that he gives all the other horses. You know, he'd like pin his ears and throw his head and lunge at him. And Ranger wouldn't move. He would stand his ground and be like, what? What are you going to do? <laughs> and that to me, I was like, well, if the lead horse can't get him under <laughs> thumb how am I gonna do it right because I don't have the weight and the the just the physical mass that the horses have to push each other around and so it's like that's the point when it becomes the mind games then you have to start fig figuring out how to outsmart them so to speak and how to be like okay I see what you're trying to do I'll raise you on that and I'll try to but I wasn't smart enough I'm not smart enough to outthink a wild horse. They, they're they clever buggers. Um, so that's, he's in the perfect spot now. He's with my friend, Katie, who she really, I call her the horse therapist because she really understands the mind of a horse. And she already has a wild horse um, that she's had for several years and worked with him. So she knows they think a little differently. They're not just like your domesticated, easygoing quarter horse. They are always thinking one step ahead because they've had to, to survive. And I always say, you know, in wild horse herds, even wild dog packs that exist, only the smart survive because the dumb ones get picked off pretty quick. And so if you have a wild horse, it's had to survive from whatever age until you got it, it's going to be always thinking about its next step and how it's going to survive and how it's going to reach the top and all of these things. So um, yeah, I, I do believe going back to your original question that the parenting aspects and the, the herd dynamics all play a very important role and they're all just meshed together. Yeah, I, I love your, I love listening to you talk about animals. There's just so much to learn from you. So like, I think it's really great. And I do want to ask you to, um, because you're so busy, this is switching a little bit here, but you're constantly doing something new. And I know that um, you had gotten into you know, uh, flipping houses. And then that went to the, the um, apartment that you're working on above the restaurant, which is now Marshall's Country Store. And so I would like to ask you, 
uh, one, where do you find the time to do everything? And two, <laughs> what, what nudge did you feel that you were like, okay, this is something that I want to explore and try different in my life? For me, it's, I'm very spontaneous with things that I do. And I, I don't know if it's just that my mind is always going, I'm always thinking of new things to do. And I like challenging myself. Um, and sometimes that's a bad thing. Like, it's not always a good thing to be this busy because there's times when I'm like, you know what? I would like to sleep in today, or I would like to just lay on the couch today. It doesn't happen often, <laughs> but when it does, and I'm like, but I, I can't, like, I can't do that. I have this meeting and I have to get here and I have to rent all this and I have to, whatever it might be. But I do believe in the last probably year and a half to two years, ever since I opened Marshall's Country Store, I have learned a very important trait that I wish I had have learned years ago. And that is the art of delegation. And I didn't have it. I did not have it prior to two years ago. I would do everything myself if my fingers were bleeding and I was couldn't even take a step. I would be like, nope, I will do it. I will do it. I've never, like, I've never had a house cleaner. I've never had a, someone to come help me with chores. I've never had, like, I have always been the person that I'm like, I will do it. And I feel bad when I ask for help. Like, I don't ever want to be like, Hey, can you come help me? Like, do, and my husband, like, he's very willing to help, but he knows that anytime he's like, Oh, you want my help? I'll be like, Nope, I'm good. So he just, he's like, okay, well, you know where to find me if you need help, but I'm not going to bug you because I know you're doing your thing. And so I've, I've really learned that you can ask for help. You can have people around you that, and that goes back to that whole support group, right? Like trusting those people around you, trusting your team to lift you up. And that's something that was a really good lesson for me to learn in my thirties. I'm glad that I didn't wait any longer, but to be able to say, I need help with this. Can you guys help me? And I had to do that with the store because I opened the store. It was kind of spontaneous. I didn't, there was no plans of me opening a store until one day I decided I'm going to open a store. And it was just completely out of the blue. Like it was not something that I was like, oh, maybe I'll do this. I was just like, I started painting the walls. Let's open a store. Okay. We'll be open in three months. Let's get going. And, but then I started back at work at Heartland and we work long hours. It's a full-time job, but now I also had this store and I wanted the store to be successful. I wanted it to be something that I could be proud of, but in order for me to do that, I knew that I had to trust my team to help me get there because I couldn't do it all. I was at work. I, you know, it was, it was a busy time and I was coming home from work, stopping at the store for an hour, even just like doing finishing touches. And um, before we opened, I was there late at night painting trim and doing different things like that. And I thought, I can't, I just can't physically do this because I was tired and I wasn't, um, then Heartland was suffering because of it, because I wasn't myself, you know, I didn't get enough sleep, all of these things. And I learned, I was like, you know, there's things when you can just step back and say, I just have to trust other people to do this for me. And so I've gotten much better at that. And that has been an excellent learning tool for me to just to be able to let go. And, and I've got such a great team at the store now. Um, my manager, Kira, I've now I'm letting her do a lot of the ordering and that kind of thing. And at first I was like, no, like it's my store. I want to, I'm, I'm very, I hold things just like my animals. I'm like, they're my animals. Like I want to do all the chores. I want to, but I found I'm like, you know what, we can share this vision and we can share this passion. And she's been so good at it that now I'm like, okay, so let's do this together. You put out the order and I'll look it over and I'll, and then all of a sudden I'll be surprised at some of the stuff that I'm like, I never would have thought to bring that in. Like good work. I love it. And I think that that's something that I just needed to go through in my life. And I needed to be like, yeah, it's, it's okay to trust other people to do things for you. And in the end, it makes you even more proud of the team and the people that you brought together. Because when you see it working and you, and you're like, Oh, like, this is fun. You know, this is, this is really cool. This is a great, um, and, and for me, cause I spend so much time when I'm not working on Heartland at home with my animals. I'm like, this is a whole new adventure. This is a whole new learning experience for me. And one of the cool things about the store was that none of us who work there had any retail experience at all. 
So all of us were like, you know what, we're just going to figure this out as we go. And we ask questions and we visit people who have done this for years. And it's, I think that it's very inspirational for not only my team, but for anyone else who is wanting to do something where they think, oh, I never went to school for that, or I, I have no prior um, education in this field at all. I think as long as you have the passion and the dedication and the willingness to put in the time and effort to make it work, then you're going to succeed. It's sometimes the people that have endless years of experience in a field, but they're complacent. They've kind of come to a point where like, ah, I've done this. So they don't grow. They don't learn. They don't kind of transition into the way that things are run now. So that's kind of why I was like, I just want people who are open to to learning and to to going with the flow and, and that sort of thing too. So then it makes us all really proud when things work because you're like, yes, team, like we have no idea what we're doing and look at what we've accomplished. <laughs> yeah. When you, um, I visited the store a couple of times and I love it because when you walk in, it's just, you just kind of feel like you're at home. Everyone's very friendly. Everything's meticulous. Like it's, it's very, very nice. So when you were building your store, what was the biggest challenge for you outside of like once you once it was up and running and then you said you had to get people to help you? But prior to that, like yes. getting your business started, what was what was your biggest challenge? I think right off the bat, the biggest challenge was that the building itself needed a lot of work. Um, so we were trying to figure out, OK, how long is this all going to take? When can we open our doors? Because I had to plan getting product in the store but I couldn't bring product in because we did a full gut. Like we ripped out walls and re drywalled and put in all new lighting, all new flooring, all like everything. It was a full complete gut of that building. We even had to cut out big chunks of the floor and get underneath and jack it up because the floor was all sagging and rotting and falling apart. And um, so I think that in the, the initial stages, that was a challenge because I thought, okay, I'm not in a huge rush to open my doors, but at the same time, when the doors are open, I better have something on the shelves because you don't want to open the doors to an empty store. So that's why we really dove into the local vendors because I thought here's something where we can get product quickly if we give them a heads up and say, hey, we're probably going to open summer of 2022. Um, what would you have on hand that we could bring into the store. And that was really great too, because I was able to meet a lot of the local vendors and get that relationship with them early on. And that was before I opened up any big accounts where it was like, okay, so if you want to order for fall 2024, that order has to be placed in fall of 2023. And that was a big kind of eye opener to me. Cause I'm like, you have to be planning a year in advance for product because they essentially they're making it all right. So they want to know their orders before it's all made. And so I think that that was my biggest learning curve was that I had gone to all the local vendors. I had stuff in the store. So it's, it's not like we were empty and they could pretty much deliver whenever I was out of something. So let's say we have a local woman who makes purses. So she made some beautiful purses. And then I was like, Oh, like three sold today. And she's like, I'll start on some more. And that kind of stuff was great. But then as soon as you start bringing in the bigger accounts, you have to plan a year in advance. So that was our biggest struggle right off the bat was being able to be current. And when you just go on and do an order, like say I, I went to Wrangler, for example, and I'm like, okay, I need to get in um, this many t-shirts and sweatshirts and whatever it might be. They're like, okay, well, we've already placed all our orders. So here's what we have left. So then it was like, okay, so I only have one small, four mediums, no larges, like you were limited to what you could bring in because it's basically just what's left over. Um, so that was a very big learning curve for me and being able to visualize when you order something a year in advance, I'm very particular with the look and the feel. Like you said, when you walk in, I want it to feel very homey and I want all of the color pattern to palette to kind of come together. So if I'm bringing in a whole bunch of uh, reds, I don't all of a sudden want to have an orange that doesn't line up with that red. So when we look at our, our orders, it's like, okay, so what, 
what are we looking at? What's the color palette for this year? All right, so if we're gonna order reds, blues, and yellows, then I wanna make sure that every company that we're ordering from, they all kind of are, they flow, right? They go together. And so that was another thing that's been just a little bit of a challenge because you have to be ahead of the times, but you also have to know what you want and what your customer base is going to want. Because how do I know what the weather is going to be like in fall of 2025, right? So it's like, it's it's been a very interesting learning experience. And we've brought things in that were a total flop. And we brought things in that we only brought a couple of, and they sold like hotcakes. And we're like, okay, so going forward every year, you kind of learn what works and what doesn't. And I don't think there'll ever be a time where you're not learning and you're not adjusting and you're not saying, okay, so next time I would do this or let's plan for this because we knew it happened this year and we weren't expecting it. Um, So just things like that, that, I mean, it'll be just two years that we've been open this summer and I have learned a ton in those two years and I know that I'm going to continue to learn. And that was one of the reasons why I decided on a whim to start the store because like you said, I can't not be busy. And I got thinking we're, you know, we're season seven or it was season 16 of Heartland at the time. I thought, what happens if Heartland ends tomorrow? What am I going to do? So that was kind of part of the thinking process is that if I can get this store up and running, then when I'm done Heartland, I can focus more time into it. And it gives me something to do and to keep busy and, and that sort of thing as well. Would you ever consider like in the future expanding, like having different locations for the store or do you want to keep it small? I would like to keep it small just because I feel like, again, that fits in. It's a little bit more authentic to who I am. Um, I'm not a, a big, bold, showy person. And so for me, having a bunch of stores all over the place that I have to keep track of is not really on my list, but that's not to say it won't happen. I don't know. Like, I also don't like to set myself up for saying or closing a door before one has even been opened. Um, But I think for me, I just really want to focus on, on the store we have. And that's not to say that we wouldn't want to expand one day because it is, it's quite a small space. And we've learned that very quickly trying just to fit product into it. It's, it's a bit of a challenge. You have to get very selective with what you order. Um, And that's another reason we haven't been able to bring in a lot of denim products and a lot of shoes or boots because we just don't have anywhere to put them. So there's, it's not to say that I wouldn't want to expand one day, but I wouldn't want to franchise. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a fine line, I think. Okay. And I know, okay, your husband is extremely talented. And I know a lot of people love his photographs. And you had shared, uh, I think it was a couple years ago, he made these beautiful like horseshoe uh, creations in your home. Um, Has he ever considered creating stuff to sell for your store? Or have you ever asked him to do that? I've asked him. Um, I think it's funny, because he he's a very he's a very quiet person. He doesn't like to be in the public eye. He doesn't like to put his stuff out there. You know, I think as an actor, we're just used to having, really, I'm selling myself as an actor, right? Like it sounds funny, but I'm putting myself out there and I am the product. Whereas Sean is, he's very proud of the work he does, but he's very internal about it. He's not showy. He doesn't like to, like he he doesn't like photos of himself or his work, right? Like he's just... I don't know. And I think that's one of my favorite qualities about him is he's very humble about that kind of thing. So I have thrown it out there. I've been like, hey, you should make some like horseshoe art or do some things like that for the store. And I even said, why don't I I make some of your prints and put them in the store? And he did say yes on that. He's like, yeah, if you want to do that. He's like, I'm fine with that. I just haven't got my button gear and printed them. But um, I think that that's something that would be nice also for for the fans, too, because a lot of people they, they want to come to the store and they want to experience my life and the things that mean the most to me. And I'm very proud of Sean for everything that he's done. And so being able to offer things that he's created, I think are special to me. And I, I believe that it would be special to those people that come in as well. Yeah. He's really talented. I loved his horseshoe art before. I was like, I want some of that. Um, So for my (laughs) final question for you, uh, I'd like to know, 
What has been the most rewarding thing for you about opening up your own business? That's a really good question too. You're on fire today. <laughs> oh man. I, I just think that for me, I'm never content when I'm stagnant, so to speak. And that's such an awful word to say, but it's, I always have to be moving forward to feel contentment. And so the store gave me something new that I can put my energy into that makes me feel alive. You know, it, it makes you feel like you're really moving forward. And I think that's the, the greatest gift that we have in life is being able to be excited about the things that we're doing. And as soon as you're not excited about something, it just loses all its magic and it makes you not want to be a part of it. And again, that's one of the reasons why I believe Heartland has done so well and is continuing to, to be such a success is because we all genuinely love it. We enjoy being a part of it. It's not something that has become, I don't know, one of those mundane tasks that we're like, oh, we got to go to work today. It's something that we're still all passionate about. And that's what the store does for me as well. It's something that I'm like, yes, I'm proud of this. It's something that I can put my time and energy into and I enjoy it. And it's different. It's not, it's not what I ever would have imagined myself doing um, because those who know me know that I still wear a lot of the same clothes from high school and I'm a big thrifter and I'm, I've never been into, you know, designer labels and clothes and price tags. Like I'm someone who likes comfort and I want to, I want to wear things that I'm comfortable in that make me feel happy. Um, so that was when I opened the store, I'm like, now I have to put things on the shelves and like, I'm not a shopper. I'm the world's worst shopper. My mom still buys clothes for me. Cause she's like, Amber, you need something new. <laughs> so that's again, when I've learned so much in the last few years, and I've also allowed myself to have the support of my team around me to help choose things. And there's a lot of trends that we'll be looking through magazines and, and ordering things. And I'll be like, what is that? And my girls will say, oh, it's really in style right now. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> you know, and things that I feel like I'm more current now. And I feel like I'm, I'm inspired by the trends and, and the different people around me that are like helping me do this, this, this adventure that I never thought I would have been taking on. Um, so I think that's, again, something that's outside of my comfort zone um, are things that really light my fire, right? It's something that I'm like, yeah, I don't know how to do this. So let's learn, let's do it. And that's what keeps me moving forward. And that's what keeps me really not just inspired about the store, but in life, right? I think that when you're passionate about something, it translates to everything and everyone around you. You are an incredibly genuine and authentic person. Thank you so much for this. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, well, I appreciate the chat today. It was fun. Thank you.